Welcome, everyone. This is All Minus One Story Time with your favorite host, Bill. How are we doing today? Ah, so story time is the segment that I do every Monday and Thursday where I read to you great writings, great books, great ideas from great men, supposedly. Um, the point of this segment is to just read things that I find interesting. And one of the things that I found interesting not long ago was this book right here. I actually finally got a hard copy in, uh, ordered like a month ago, and that is Nihilism, the Root of Revolution of the Modern Age by Father uh, Sephrim Rose. And um, we have it right here. You can find this online for free. And uh, we are in the section and the stages of nihilistic dialectic. So, without further ado, let's get into it, guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, The liberalism we shall describe in the following pages is not, let us state at the outset, an overt nihilism. It is rather a passive nihilism, or better yet, the natural breeding ground of the more advanced stages of nihilism. Those who have followed our earlier discussions concern uh, concerning the impossibility of spiritual or intellectual neutrality in this world will understand immediately why we have classified as nihilist a point of view which, while not directly responsible for any striking nihilist phenomenon, has been an indispensable prerequisite for their appearance. The incompetent defiance by liberalism of a heritage in which it has never fully believed has been one of the most potent causes of, um, of an nihilism. The liberal humanist civilization, which in Western Europe was the last form of the old order that was effectively destroyed in the Great War and the revolutions of the second decade of the century, and which continues to exist through in an ever more attenuated democratic form, the free world today may be principally characterized by its attitude to truth. This is not an attitude of open hostility, nor even of deliberate unconcern, for its sincere apologists undeniably have a genuine regard for what they consider to be truth. Rather, it is an attitude in which truth, despite certain appearances, no longer occupied the center of attention, the truth in which it is professed to believe, apart of a course from scientific fact, is for it no spiritual or intellectual uh, con off current circulation, but idle and unfruitful capital left over from a previous age. The liberal still speaks, at least on formal occasion, of eternal uh, varieties of faith, of human dignity, of man's high calling, or his unquenchable spirit, even of Christian civilization. But it is quite clear that these words no longer mean what they once meant. No liberal takes them with entire uh, seriousness. They are, in fact, metaphors, ornaments of language that are meant to evoke an emotional, not an intellectual response, a response largely conditioned by long usage with uh, attention, or sorry, attendant memory of a time when such words actually had a positive and serious meaning. <coughs> Excuse me, guys, I did not sleep well, and I think that, ha and that between that and the weather, I feel a little flimmy, a little uh, congested, so uh, whatever. So please excuse me as I try to get through this. But in any case, what does he say here? Well, to sum it up, liberalism came up in Western Europe. This, this really happened during the 1800s, the 19th century, right? And it, it, it primarily happened um, as an expression of the Renaissance. So by the 1800s, it was in full fruition of what I call, what many people call today, classical liberalism. Now, this... Uh, it is a distinction that was, um, I believe, created by the Fabians, or at least according to uh, our friend Don the Pleb. But um, as as much as I am aware of the Fabians and their their 
crazy ideas and their uh, takeover of England back in the day. I wouldn't call them liberals or anyone who existed in that organization. A classical liberal is someone who believes in the centralized idea of uh, individuality, right? You, you, are, you own yourself. You are an individual. You are uh, a person who owns your own labor, your work. You have a right to be free, to do as you please, go where you like. Again, as long as it is not invading upon someone else. And those concepts are still there, but the modern liberal takes those things and then they go, oh, but what about your feelings? Uh, what about this? Well, what about the greater consequence to society? And what they've done is, is they've come from this position where classical liberals were always Christians and moral folk, and they have taken on the progressive position. They have forgotten the morality. They've forgotten their history, and they have embraced Nietzsche. Uh, and Nietzsche, of course, is the basically grandfather or modern modern father of uh, nihilism. But Nietzsche is important because Nietzsche made predictions that came true. And so we had to understand that Nietzsche had some great insight, even in his own insanity um, that eventually led to his death, by the way. Uh, in any case, what he's saying here is that the words that are used come from this old speak and this old language and this old time. It, it's vestigial. It's useless. It's there, but it doesn't mean anything. It's like telling someone that you're sorry because you're supposed to say it, not because you mean it, right? That's what he's saying, in essence. No one today who prides himself on uh, this uh, sophistication that is to say, very few in academic institutions and government and science and humanist intellectual circles, no one who wishes or professes to be abreast of the times does or can fully believe in absolute truth, or more particularly in Christian truth. Right, because with that coming up, that enlightenment period that led to the classical liberal age, to the laissez-faire age that brought more people out of poverty than, than any other period of history and had the boom of technology, um, what happened though is, is that it became secular. And as he mentioned before, they were humanists, right? It became secular, it became worldly of the world and it got its mind off of God. And that's not where it started. That's not where it came from at all. You read any, anyone who's considered a classical liberal, John Stuart Mills, John Locke, uh, Lord Montesquieu, Edmund Burke, all Christians, uh, what the, the Tocqueville, uh, Bastiat, one of my favorites, uh, all were Christian men, all believed in the truth of God, the creator of the universe and Christ. Now, they might have been different denominations to some extent or, or uh, another, but they believed in the same universal truths. Yet the name of truth has been retained as have been the names of those truths men once regarded as absolute. And few in any position of authority or influence would hesitate to use them even when they are aware that their meanings have changed. Truth in a word has been uh, reinterpreted. The old forms have been emptied and given a new quasi nihilist content. This may easily be seen by a brief examination of several of the principal areas in which the truth has been uh, reinterpreted. In the theological order, the first truth is, of course, God. Amen. Omnipotent, omnipresent creator of all, revealed to faith and in the experience of the faithful, and not contradicted by the reason of those who do not deny faith. God is the supreme end of all creation, and himself, unlike his creation, finds his end in himself. Everything created stands in relation to and dependence upon him, who alone depends upon nothing outside of himself. He has created the world that it might live in enjoyment of him. And everything in the world is oriented toward this end, which, however, men may miss by the misuse of their freedom. And make no mistakes, folks, God created you in his image as a free being. The fall, if you want to understand the proper 1st, 2nd, 3rd century uh, understanding of this, the fall was not that that you have some sort of sin that makes you evil 
uh, because Adam sinned and it carried on through the generations. No, 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 no. The fall happened because Adam sold his birthright, being a son of God, to Satan. He gave loyalty to the, the king of this world. And that is how Satan became the king of this world, because Adam chose to obey him instead of allowing himself to be the king of the world. This is also why there, uh, the scriptures talk about two Adams. There was the first Adam and the second Adam in Christ, right? It was the rebooting of things, if you would. So the idea is, is that Adam sold his birthright, his kingship over to Satan and became a slave to him and brought death into the world as God cursed the earth for his rejection, Adam's rejection of God, the creator of the universe, and his word. Now, his word is the logos, his word is Christ. And he told Adam, do not eat of this fruit. Yet Adam disobeyed. So again, that did not bring some evil nature upon man. No, 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 no. We were always free to do good or evil. But as the uh, lordship of the earth was given to man, it was then passed to Satan. And that is the, 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 the understanding of the two kingdoms as well. Um, it, again, it's not this generational thing where it's not Calvinism, where Calvin basically got these ideas from Augustine because he was an Augustinian monk. And Augustine was actually very traditional originally on after he left Manichaeanism. But in his later life, I think in his 70s or 80s, as he wrote, um, he went back to his Gnostic Manichaean beliefs. And there was a lot of weird stuff there that basically reverses everything. And you'd have to understand uh, uh, what the Gnostics believe, the, the mystery schools, the occult and all that kind of stuff. But in brief, it basically makes God the evil one and Satan the, the, the good one. And in Calvinism, basically, God created Satan. Therefore, God is the author of evil. And that's just not true, folks. It is a matter of free will. God loves you so much that he let you be free to serve him or to not serve him. That's that's a pretty heavy thing to, to really dwell on. Because if you have all power in all the world and you want to be loved, does your love uh does your love get fulfilled? That that wanting of love, if you want it at all, that admiration, does that get fulfilled by force? Of course, the answer is no. Because force is slavery, folks. <laughs> when you when you force things upon people, you enslave them. That's how it works. Um, it, yeah. So God must allow you to be free. In any case, sorry, that's a long tangent. The modern mentality cannot tolerate such a God. He is both too intimate, too personal, even too human, and too absolute, too uncompromising in his demands of us. And he makes himself known only to humble faith, a fact bound to alienate the proud modern intelligence. That's true. A new God is clearly required by modern man, a God more closely fashioned after the pattern of such central modern concerns as science and business. Oh, yeah. Looks like uh, Klaus Schwab might have read this at one point. <laughs> it has, in fact, been an important intention of modern thought to provide such a god this intention is clear around uh already in uh, descartes it is brought to fruition in the uh, uh denise of enlightenment developed to its end in german idealism the new god is not a being but an idea not revealed to faith and humility but constructed by the proud mind that still feels the need for explanation when it has lost its desire for salvation. This is the dead God of philosophers who require only a first cause to complete their system, as well as positive thinkers and other religious sophists who invent a God because they need him and then think to use him at will, whether deist Idealist, pantheist, uh, immanist, all the modern gods are the same mental construct fabricated by souls dead from the loss of faith in the true God. Christ said, let the dead bury their dead. 
And he was talking about those who were not living in him and in the father. Um, yeah, this is, this is all true. And actually this centralized part of the sentence here from says this intention is clear already in Descartes. And he goes through this and he talks about the, uh, deism of the enlightenment and the German idealism, the German idealism straight from Nietzsche guys, straight out of all what, what Nietzsche was. Remember, you have to understand that before world war two, Germany and the Germanic nations were highly influential to the world, highly influential. Um, maybe not as much today, but it's because of that stain, which is ridiculous, by the way. We're, we're, we're talking about, this was a uh, hundred years ago, nearly. But for but we're petty people, we're, uh, we're a petty species, I should say. And we're worried about that. Well, we are a petty people today. We're worried about something that happened a hundred years ago with people mostly that don't exist anymore because of some horrible atrocities. Um, I get it. It's time to move on, though, you know, but before that blemish, Germany was very influential. And so a lot of philosophy was coming out of there. Uh, why do you think uh, uh, or where do you think Marx came from? Right. Um, no, Marx was writing. He was in England at the time, but, you know, Germanic by birth. So in any case, uh, in, in the Germanic philosophies and, of course, the in, into the Slavic world, because they have some shared heritage, they uh, they kind of have a shared collective history of collectivism. Um, Slavs specifically being basically slaves up until, what, 200 years, 300 years ago? Literally, they were prized as slaves. Some of the best slaves that, that slave traders would get would be from the Slavic nations. And, uh, you know, we, we, we don't think about this. And our word slave comes from that word Slav, the word Slav literally means tongue and it was a common tongue amongst the people at some point or another um but again that kind of gives you the idea of who's ready for collectivism and who isn't and our society has had to uh, been indoctrinated with it for a long period of time now it's not hard with modern technology to indoctrinate a whole society and back in the day information moved much slower so that indoctrination would have been slower but today it you know happens in a second right the atheist arguments against such a god are irrefutable as they are irrelevant for such a god is in fact the same as no god at all uninterested in man powerless to act in the world except to inspire a worldly optimism he is a god considerably weaker than the men who invented him on such a foundation needless to say nothing secure can be built and it what and it is with good reason that liberals while usually professing belief in this deity actually build their worldview upon the more obvious though hardly more stable foundation of man nihilist atheism is the explicit formulation of what was already not merely implicit, but actually present in a confused form in liberalism. So, um, the the, uh, the statement here, this paragraph says the atheist arguments against such a god are irrefutable. Um, that it says uh, uninterested in man, powerless to act in the world. Yada yada yada. This is the same kind of god that Buddhism sees. That if there was a God, that he wouldn't even care about you because you'd be like an ant to him. That's absurd because you build nothing, you make nothing that you don't have pride in. I like my food porn. My Instagram, uh, I have one for the channel and that is in the description. But my Instagram, my personal Instagram has a lot of food pictures in it because I like to cook. I'm proud of what I make. I make it uh, tasty and presentable. It's a form of artistic expression for me. No one who creates something and does a good job in it does not have pride in their creation. And the problem with Buddhism, the primarily pro primary problem with Buddhism is that it cannot see that truth and thus misses the logos. It misses the purpose and the reason and the reality. It misses the plan. Buddhism is great as far as its rejection of material life, but, um, and, and also kind of being even keeled, you know, not, not going to extremes, but there is no logos within it. 
And that's the same as what uh, Father Rose is talking here about liberalism. And again, he's talking about modern liberalism. He's writing this in the 1960s. Um, not as I uh, uh, put out there, uh, the ideas of classical liberalism. Um, and I eventually will probably come up with a better term, I would say. I can talk like our friends over at the Weekly Narrative and say I'm an alt-centrist or something of the sort, <laughs> right? The ethical implications of belief in such a God are precisely the same as those of atheism. This inner agreement, however, is again disguised outwardly behind a cloud of metaphor. In the Christian order, all activity in this life is viewed and judged in the light of the life of the future world, the life beyond death, which will have no end. The unbeliever can have no idea of what this life means to the believing Christian. For most people today, the future life has, like God, become a mere idea. And it therefore costs as little pain and effort to deny it as to affirm it. For the believing Christian, the future life is joy inconceivable. Joy surpassing the joy he knows in his life through communion with God and prayer and the liturgy and the sacrament. Because then God will be all in all, and there will be no falling away from his joy, which will indeed be indefinitely enhanced. The true believer has the consolation of a foretaste of eternal life. The believer in the modern God, having no such foretaste, and hence no notion of Christian joy, cannot believe in the future life in the same way. Indeed, if he were honest with himself, he would have to admit that he cannot believe in it at all. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you will find joy in a true connection with God. And this is why people who don't have true belief, belief is something you act on folks. It isn't something you say, right? The, the old axiom actions speak louder than words. It's because I can tell you all I want that I'm not punching you in the face. While I'm punching you in the face, I'm still punching you in the face, even though I'm saying I'm not, right? Um, the, it doesn't matter what you say, guys. It matters what you do. Christ said it isn't what goes in to the vessel that makes one unclean. It's what comes out. And he said this to the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees who were complaining that his men weren't washing their hands or they didn't wash um, the inside of a bowl or something, the inside of a cup. And, of course, he made a metaphorical statement about the being, the inner being. Now, the early Christians were very protective of what they took into their body. Christ also said that the eye is the lamp of, uh, what is it, the, the lamp of the heart or something of, to that extent. I cannot recall. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, guys. Um, but he was saying what your eye looks at shines a light on what you have in your heart right? That's the whole idea of the eye is the window to the soul, right? So um, the early Christians took this very seriously, and they were very careful about what they participated in. Uh, they wouldn't go to the circuses, the gladiatorial games. Now, some might. Uh, even in the day, back in their times, the theater, you know, um, drama, uh, fiction was just as hedonistic as it is today, just as uh, abrasive, just as wicked. Uh, when I had a, a true conversion for a while, I got rid of all kinds of movies and stuff that I have. Now, i kind of gotten over that. Maybe I would do better to, to have remained on that path. I don't know. But all I'm saying is, is that, yes, we do live in the world, but we, we need to protect ourselves from what we take in. At the same time, it's what comes out that is most important. And you can only understand that in true faith. And people that don't have true faith never understand that. They don't get that connection. They don't get that pure joy. They don't see the moments when God acts in their lives. And I can tell you there are many that you become aware to just instantly. Weird things happen. Weird things happen. I'll put it that way. Um, and, and someone who has a, a shallow belief, who doesn't live their beliefs, they, they can never have this kind of connection. Because they they to in, in order for them to live their beliefs, there has to be some sort of joy or passion to drive that. It can't just be 
well, this is what I'm supposed to do, therefore I'm going to do it. Very few people are that disciplined. Very few. Uh, in fact, the default for people is to be undisciplined. I can assure you. <laughs> it would not be called discipline otherwise. It would not be a hard thing to do. It would be easy. There are two primary forms of such disbelief which pass for liberal belief, the Protestant and the humanist. The liberal Protestant view of the future life shared regrettably by increasing numbers who profess to be Catholic or even Orthodox is, like its view on everything else pertaining to the spiritual world, a minimal profession of faith that masks an actual faith in nothing. 100% easy believism. Going to church, going to that altar call, getting on your knees and saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, Lord, come into my heart. Well, I'm sorry, guys, if you don't live it, it doesn't mean anything. Go back to the parable of the sower and how the different seeds fell and where they fall. They fall on the wayside, on the rocky soil. They fall in the grass or they fall in the thorns, right? Where was the good soil? The grass, right? The good soil raised a believer up. The rest of the seed fell and scattered and either didn't plant itself, was swept up right away, or the person endured for a little bit and cared more for the world, as Christ said. And uh, yeah, yeah, and I would agree. Most, um, uh, I think Catholics, you have a problem because of your papacy and you are not following scripture. The church provides you salvation. That is antithetical to Christianity. I think that the, the, the Calvinists have a problem with their, you know, circular logic on predestination and free will, which is a whole nother, you know, aside I can get into. Um, the charismatics believe too much in the emotional implications of the, the spiritual experience with God, the relationship with God. There's absolutely an emotional component to it. But there has to be a logical, rational one as well. You cannot just be in faith on an emotional uh, roller coaster, right? I would wager to say that's closer to what the evil one has a calling for. And he wants you to follow him based on your passions and that emotional high. I mean, I'm one. I know from my sins, from my past, that that's exactly what I would do with women and you get that buzz you get that high and it goes away and then you need that again it's like a drug you just need to keep doing it so guys uh keep that in mind right uh that this is a, a cancer now in our world now and orthodoxy is seen as uh and i'm not an orthodox christian folks uh, but I do respect the Orthodox Church highly, and I use an Orthodox Bible, um, and I read their writings and, and things quite often because they've kept a pretty good lineage. And um, they, they believe that they are the religion of the future, and they are trying to uh, proselytize to the world, and rightfully so, because they do have the oldest lineage, although it may not be exactly as the early church worshipped. They, they do see the... Uh, the predictions and the foreshadowing of Christ all throughout the Old Testament, which is what the Old Testament is about. It's about Christ, guys. Just like how the New Testament points back to Christ too. They all point back to Christ because Christ is the purpose. He's the logos. He is the reason. He's the word, the logic for all existence and why we exist. In any case, I'm going to read another paragraph or two and then we're going to close it out for the day. So it says, the future life has become a shadowy underworld in the popular conception of it, a place to take one's deserved rest after the life of toil. Nobody has a very clear idea of this uh, realm, for it corresponds to no reality. It is rather an emotional projection, a consolation for those who would rather not face the implications of their actual disbelief. And there you go, because I have not read this before, guys. I'm reading this cold. So the future life has become a shadowy underworld in the popular conception of it. A place to take one's deserved rest after a life of toil. This is for the the unbeliever or the, the person who's confused, right? 
Nobody has a very clear idea of this realism, for it corresponds to no reality. It is rather an emotional projection, a consolation for those who would rather not face the implications of their actual disbelief. And that is eternal suffering and separation from God. Such a heaven is the fruit of a union of Christian terminology with ordinary worldliness, and it is uh, convincing to no one who realizes that compromise in such ultimate matters is impossible. Neither the true Orthodox Christian nor the consistent nihilist is seduced by it. But the compromise of humanism is, if anything, even less convincing. Here, there is scarcely even the pretense that the idea corresponds to reality. All becomes metaphor and rhetoric. The humanist no longer speaks of heaven at all, at least not seriously. But he does allow himself to speak of the eternal, preferably in the form of a resounding figure of speech, eternal uh, varieties, eternal spirit of men. One that may justly question whether the word has any meaning at all in such phrases. In humanist stoicism, the eternal has been reduced to the content so thin and frail as to be virtually indistinguishable from the materialist and deterministic nihilism that attempts with some justification surely to destroy it. So I'll go through that again. One may justly question whether the word has any meaning at all in such phrases. So that is eternal varieties, eternal spirit of men, da 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 da. It does only in the collective for the collectivist of, of uh, the, the progressives. And they see that mankind cannot exist outside of the collective and outside. It cannot be man, man cannot exist outside of history or sorry, within history, outside of the collective, outside of the state. They see this long game of humanity, which is why they don't mind sacrificing part of humanity today. They will murder and kill and do whatever to, to weed out whatever they think is wrong and evil because in the long game, in the long run, humanity will reach its utopian heaven here on earth. It's the story of the Tower of Babel to some degree. It's the, the Rousseauian noble savage idea, the return to Eden, that we are going to do it on our own, that we will make utopia, that we will make the perfect world, that we will return to our innocence even through death and destruction. In either case, in that of the liberal Christian or uh, the even more liberal humanist, the inability to believe in eternal life is rooted in the same fact. They believe only in this world. They have neither experience nor knowledge of it, nor faith in the other world. And most of all, they believe in a God who is not powerful enough to raise men from the dead. Amen, brother. Uh, this is Paul's argument in Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talks about being raised from the dead. And if you do not believe in the resurrection, then what is the point? You might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you shall die. And that was a Stoicist saying. That's what the Stoics said. The resurrection is important. And you, if you are in the faith, must live the resurrection today. I promise you this. As Father Rose said earlier in this, if you do not live in some part as if you are in the next life today, you will not partake in the next life. Let's read one more sentence here, or one more uh, paragraph here. It says, behind the rhetoric, the sophisticated Protestant and the uh, humanist are quite aware that there is no room for heaven nor for eternity in their universe their thoroughly liberal sensibility again looks. Sorry, I lost my place there. <laughs> Where am I at here, guys? Uh, liberal sensibility again looks not to a transcendent, but to an eminent source for its ethical doctrine. And their agile intelligence is even capable of turning this. Uh, de... Guys, I'm not a French speaker. Uh, de moi. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's how you say that or not, into a positive uh, apology. And I don't know the term. Uh, we'll have to look that up. It is in uh, this both view, realism and courage, to live without hope of eternal joy, nor fear of eternal pain, to be endowed with the liberal view of things. It is not necessary to believe in heaven or hell to lead a good life. 
in this world, such as the total blindness of the liberal mentality to the meaning of death. And this was what I was getting at with the modern liberalism versus like the classical liberalism, because the modern liberals are just progressives, guys. Now, you might go, well, they're not like the far left. Well, no, probably not. But they are uh, part of the left. So um, I think that's a good place to start to stop this. Um, actually, let's read this last sentence or the last paragraph here, and then we'll we'll get to stopping it here. So if, if there's no immortality, the liberal believes no one can can lead a uh, civilized life. If there is no immortality, is a far profounder logic of Ivan uh, Kermazov and uh, Dostoevsky's novel, uh, All Things Are Lawful. This is also the same thing that was said by Aleister Crawley. He said that the law, the whole of the law, is do what thou willst. And that is the whole of the law. Do whatever pleases you. It's humanistic hedonism. These people aren't liberals. They're libertines. They're different words, guys. A libertine is someone who's careless, free of responsibility, lives life without basically any care for anything. The story of Dorian Gray, uh, the portrait of Dorian Gray, uh, is all about a libertine hedonistic life. Dorian Gray was able to endure such a life because he had a painting that kept him forever young. In any case, uh, check that out sometime if you are not aware of that. Humanist stoicism is possible for certain individuals for a certain time until that is the full implication of their denial of immortality strikes home. And um, Tolstoy understood this. The liberal lives in a fool's paradise, which must collapse before the truth of things. If death is, as the liberal and nihilistic both believe, the extinction of the individual, then this world and everything uh, in it love, goodness, uh, sanctity, everything, are as nothing, nothing man may do is of any ultimate consequence, and the full horror of life is hidden from man only by the strength of their will to deceive themselves. And all things are lawful. No other worldly hope or fear restrains men from monstrous experiments and suicidal dreams. Nietzsche's words are the truth and prophecy of the new world that result from this view. Of all that which was formerly held to be true, not one word is to be credited. Everything which was formerly disdained as unholy, forbidden, contemptible, and fatal, all these flowers now bloom in the most charming paths of truth. And yes... Yes, 100%. When you don't see that there is a greater purpose to life, life has no purpose, right? You have to have meaning and purpose in life. Now, there are people like, say, Sargon of Akkad, Carl Benjamin, who understands the need for religion or depths of religion, who considers himself an atheist. Now, I'm sure he has meaning in his life, but again, what Father Rose is saying here, these people delude themselves or they just don't think about it. Because if you start to think about it, the reality is if you exist for a brief moment and you die, why does anything you do matter in the positive or negative? You might as well live that libertine hedonistic life. You might as well go sleep with as many women as you want, get as drunk as you want, do as many drugs as you want. Might as well kill, murder, steal, do everything that you wish you could do. All right? Everything that is considered evil. Well, we know on a basic level that morality exists amongst other species as well. That there is a hierarchy to things. That there is a natural order to how the world works. There are physics, laws of physics. I say there are laws of economics, although we try to violate those laws all the time. Um, you can't get around them, guys. They, they always come back to you. The world is set in a very precise order, and it tells me by the nature of things that there is a God. It informs me. If there were no God, the only consequence there would be was is whatever society has, and that comes down to might makes right. Now, I say this often because a nihilistic perspective is a might makes right perspective. It is a perspective, just like Father Rose said right here, all things are lawful. Or as Aleister Crawley, the great Satanist and mystic 
of the early 20th century uh, said, do what thou wilt," And he got that saying, by the way, folks, from a vision, from an alien, from a descended master, an angel or a demon, if you would. I mean, according to him, maybe he made it all up, right? Um, just understand this, that there is a place that you have to go if you're going to believe in nothing and no real future and no creator, there's a place that you have to go and, and come to a realization that your life is meaningless. And maybe you don't have to go there. Maybe you won't go there. Maybe you're not strong enough. Maybe you refuse to acknowledge what is true. I don't know, guys. But with that, hey, I've gone 40 minutes today. So 40 minutes, pretty good time, pretty good amount of reading. We will pick back up there next Thursday. If I do not get a chance to record before then one of these, I'm going to have to do it once a week or so, guys. Uh, I'll try and get some out here and there as time permits. Uh, my time is getting very limited with a wife that's due in about 12 weeks. So <laughs> amongst other things, I mean, I, I got I got house stuff to do. I got workout stuff to do. I got, uh, you know, 16-year-old daughter as well. So busy life and pregnant wife uh, makes for limited scheduling on this type of content, but I'm going to try my best to get through these. And um, even if it takes 30, 30 segments. <laughs> so guys, thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. I will be back for certain next Thursday with this on Monday. I will be reading more of Klaus Schwab's Great Reset. And um, hey, like, share, subscribe, do all that stuff. Go watch our live show, my live show, The Ends Justify the Memes on a different channel. Uh, don't usually plug that here if you guys want to donate in any way, shape, or form. Uh, when we do the live show, we have an entropy, which you can donate directly, cash. I uh, have no plans to monetize on YouTube if uh, that becomes an available option to me. Um, there is a subscribe star in the description if you would like to do that. I got one guy that supports me right now. You know, thank you very much. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, I, that is helpful, guys. It's very helpful to me and my family. And I know I have a very small channel, so I don't expect a bunch of people to donate. I know times are lean. Um, just saying, it, it is helpful for my family and uh, myself in, in, in the current situation, right? Anyways, folks, I hope you have enjoyed this. This has been all Minus One Storytime, and I wish you all well.